So last week we gave a little thought to history, and I believe found it to be rather more interesting and diversified in its implications than we have come to be accustomed to believe. Uh, this week we want to explore education. And uh, here again, there are many valuable lessons and interesting observations uh, that can be made and can be learned from this field of human endeavor. Most of us are inclined to assume that education has ridden on the back of man like the old man of the sea for thousands of years. And that what we have today in the world is a monument to the consistent processes of 50 or 60 generations. Nothing could be further from the truth. What we call education today is probably less than 150 years old. And the changes that have come about, the problems that have developed, are all the result of an interrelationship of circumstances and events which have to be considered more or less separately. Classical education, as it was in Greece and Rome, and Asiatic education were both entirely different from anything that we understand today and have not contributed very generously to our present situation. They have contributed a great deal of subject matter, but very little methodology. Several definitions of education have been given at different times. Strangely enough, most of them are a little embittered. Even the great educators have grown sarcastic when trying to define their own subject. Perhaps one of the neatest concepts that we have by way of definition is that education is the almost eternal process of the old, indoctrinating the young. This is uh, one of the things that has been observed through time. Education is always in the hand of the adult, and the adult is conferring it upon his progeny. Therefore, education is to make the child conform with the adult, not necessarily in terms of physical obedience, but in terms of intellectual point of view. As therefore, the conformity with a past generation has always at least psychologically influenced educational theory. The average so-called educated person is deficient in the natural abilities to face the future or to create a new world for himself. Training causes him to adjust to a situation which itself is not fixed. Even as he adjusts, the situation itself dissolves. And this has become a matter of increasing importance as the progress, so-called, of our culture exhilarates, becomes more pressureful in all its departments. Back at the beginning of our Western educational theory, education inherited the conflict between the Christian Church and the pagan Roman Empire. And when Christianity finally triumphed, it triumphs not only in religion, but what might be termed the broad area of cultural policy. So the church not only broke with the gods of Greece and Rome, but broke with the institutions as far as it could of these cultures. It broke with the greater part of the pre-Christian curriculum. It had to take certain things and carry them along but it made these things completely subservient to theology. Now such subservience also is found in other religious groups. And broadly speaking, the ancient world 
uh, was educated under a broad religious policy with uh, the state contributing a certain amount of help and a certain amount of negative pressure. But in the early Christianity, theology came forward to be the primary consideration of education. This was possible at that time for a number of reasons. First, the motion of culture was very slow. Uh, the actual curriculum for a school was comparatively limited. There were only certain things that the young person could study. Uh, the general attitude toward life was far more simple. The social pressures of environment were less and the competitive pressures of industry were practically non-existent. It was therefore quite possible for a child to gain an education by spending 15 years in the mastery of theology, six months in the mastery of reading, writing, and arithmetic, and two years apprenticeship to a trade. This did it. He was then ready for life. If he wanted to go into an extremely learned profession, of course, he skipped the trade because he wasn't expected to have this, except he was given certain training in order that he might make his livelihood by some trade if his profession failed. If he decided to go into theology, he merely kept on with the long program of theology with which he was already fairly well acquainted. If he wanted to go into law or medicine, he just took some more theology and a modicum of law and medicine. <coughs> so whatever subject he went into, from navigation to dialing, uh, from the study of grammar uh, to what the old physician called the study of the physics, these things were all within the broad scope of religion. A doctor knew a little about the human body, a very little about medication in general, and a great deal about the Holy Trinity. And with this background, he was content. At that time, a doctor was unaware of the existence of dissection. He had never heard of a microbe. And all that he had to do was to take his theological Latin, which he had already had in generous doses, and apply it to the translations of Galen and Avicenna, the principal pedants in medicine. So if he could read Latin, had the patience to say his beads, and study Galen and Avicenna, he was ready to hang out a shingle. Now this kind of a way of life was adequate to the time, not adequate because it was truly sufficient, but adequate because there was nothing better. There was no great competition in education in those days. There were no Einsteins, no Sir James Jeans, and no Millikins. Uh, the uh, entire development of society was essentially the perpetuation of old ways, the continuance of old ideas, and the repeated study of ancient authorities. The individual had no future for which he had to plan. The future was just the continuation of the present way of life. This went on uh, more or less consistently with one or two minor interruptions. Uh, these interruptions included the rise of the Islamic League in the Near East. Islam had never been thoroughly theologized as we know it. Islam had no elaborate concept of theological indoctrination such as dominated Europe through what we call the Dark Ages. It was therefore possible for the Islamic scholar to change the pattern of things. He still had to become an authority on the Koran. He still had to obey the laws of his country. And in legal matters especially, he had a great deal of Koran and very little of any other kind of legal instruction. In medicine, he had copious doses of the Koran and also shared in the... Uh, joyous task of reading Galen and Avicenna. But his educational program was open to more instruction. He began to become aware of philosophy, which was more or less 
uh, exiled from European education, he began to consider science, astronomy, mathematics, more in the terms of the old Grecian uh, culture. And gradually the educational institutions of the Near East uh, began to rise and uh, compare more than favorably with the similar institutions in Europe. Greek philosophy, Greek science, even Greek art and letters drifted back into Europe from the Arabic uh, nations and teachers. By this time also other situations were arising. The church began to realize that it was no longer possible merely to indoctrinate. The individual could say his beads, keep all of the holy days, and never miss the sacraments, and still be unable to administer the responsibilities of uh, collective, national, or state existence. So gradually the church broadened its area, not at the expense of theology, but at the expense of the time of the student. The curriculum began to enlarge and lengthen. Nothing that was taught was left out, but more was added, until finally schooling began to take on a little of the pretension that we recognize today. Also, as time went along, the process of dividing education into primary and secondary levels uh, evolved naturally uh, in the need for specialized education for professions and the broad separation of social strata in Europe. Uh, it was obvious that the peasant, the merchant, the shopkeeper, needed some kind of education. He had to have it. His education was for the most part uh, self-taught. Uh, he, he and his family, his neighborhood, his community, without formal benefit of schooling, uh, prepared ways for the perpetuation of useful knowledge, and out of this came what we might term the elementary theory of education. On the other hand, the priest, the lawyer, the judge, uh, the person to whom the profession was important, found it necessary uh, to enlarge his knowledge, to become more aware of a new world of lights coming from the Near East and even from the Far East. So the higher systems of education began to develop, and most of these were, of course, the cathedral universities and cloister schools, uh, which uh, gradually rose in tremendous numbers in Europe and provided a rather powerful educational pattern. I don't think it's hardly necessary to go into what all of these schools were teaching, because actually their curriculum was not very close to our own. Uh, the entire policy of education was quite different. One thing we will say, however, that the educated man of the time learned a little Latin and less Greek. He was able to continue his studies in theology, which still dominated, but he was also equipped to meet the simple emergencies of his time. He could perform the various uh, duties and responsibilities with which life uh, confronted him. About this time we have to face the consequences of the Protestant Reformation. In the Protestant Reformation a new situation arose. Up to that time education had been largely financed by the church. Most of the instructors were theologians. Uh, most of the schools were run on monastic lines. Even the early universities were really little more than cloisters. They did not impose uh, clerical obligations upon the students, but the students lived in a clerical atmosphere, took on much of the general manner of monks, and uh, were prepared for long periods of confinement in unhealthful quarters, in uncomfortable and even dangerous locations, without adequate food, without adequate medical care, without the normal hygiene of life. It was a rather rugged problem at that time to secure uh, what might be considered an adequate education. But with the coming of the Protestant Reformation in large parts of Europe, 
and increasingly in the rest of Western culture. The power of the church over education was not only weakened, but also the funds by for the maintenance of education were depleted. In a comparatively short time, most Protestant countries were in a bad way educationally. They had to turn from the church to their local uh, governments for financial help. Uh, where the church was completely out of the picture, of course, there was no cooperation either uh, from the clergy as teachers or from the church as the financing power. Thus, in a way, we have the beginning at the Reformation of the shift of educational responsibility to the state. Now, at that time, the state had practically no interest whatever in the advancing of education. The feudal princes were interested in gathering their taxes and spending the money as they pleased. Uh, the last thing they wanted to do, most of them, was to see any of it slip away uh, in instructing or educating uh, other people. So while some of the um, noble families did make some effort at education, it is true that down through the Reformation and even into the Renaissance, and probably down as late as the early years of the 18th century, uh, we can say that only a minority of noble families were literate. Uh, as late as the 13th and 14th centuries, emperors made their marks because they could not sign their own names. So we can't say that at that time education was a widespread success. It was not. Uh, it had been more successful up to the time of the Reformation. Then this loss of financial support, loss of prestige, uh, loss of the controlled and directed uh, program of making use of educated people for educated purposes, uh, these all vanished in limbo. It made very little difference to warring feudal, uh, feudal princes whether their soldiers were literate or not as long as they were appropriate men in the field ready to die for their liege and master. So nothing was done much with education. And little by little, those educational institutions that survived, uh, deprived of the austere disciplines of the cloister schools, uh, degenerated into a group of rowdy institutions so that during the grand days of old England in the time of, the, of Shakespeare and his contemporaries, the only records that we have of many English universities was the amount of alcohol consumed by the student body. That's all the records we have. It is quite obvious also that with the loss of the prestige of education, uh, the level of instruction fell. Um, instruction began to take on the position that it held in our own country 150 years ago, uh, when school teaching was a kind of a benevolence in which persons uh, with a certain moral determination to be of value to young people uh, simply turned their backs on comforts and luxuries and worked for a lifetime for a bare maintenance. And that was about all the teacher got at that time. All this period, of course, nothing much was happening in the world uh, of knowledge until the rise of the instincts of humanism in the beginning of the 17th century. Europe lived in such a way that the knowledge possessed by the father was all that the son required. It was perfectly possible, reasonable, and appropriate, therefore, that the elder should cause the child to conform with the prevailing knowledge of the time. Then we had a certain kind of knowledge explosion in the 17th century. The discovery of the Western Hemisphere, the rise of a group of brilliant intellectuals, the beginnings of such institutions as the Royal Society and the Berlin Gymnasium. These things began to affect education. Men began to reach out for more knowledge. We began to be aware of a world rather than a continent. Uh, the problems of language grew more complicated. Uh, Benjamin Franklin presented his, his discoveries in electricity. Harvey had already brought in the uh, theory of the circulation of the blood. Still earlier, Vesalius had given Europe the beginning of the study of anatomy. Uh, 
uh, lines of thinking totally unknown in the past or regarded with no particular consideration suddenly became uh, the pressing considerations of the moment. It became more and more obvious that man was determined uh, to learn to think, that he was determined uh, to think much as he pleased. The Reformation had cleared away the necessity for religious conformity. And now, under a Protestant atmosphere, or under comparatively little religious atmosphere, we see the universities and the colleges breaking not only with the old theology, but breaking even with the dominant religious systems of the countries in which they flourished. Religion gradually disappeared from the universities, and about all that was left were departments of theology for those who wished to make a religious life their primary consideration. Now this brings us to a point where we must pause and summarize, because we are in a situation that is uh, particularly interesting and psychologically important. Uh, the gradual restriction on religious teaching began to affect the primary theory of Christian education, namely that the beginning of education was the establishment of generalities in the mind. In other words, a young person growing up should first have certain general knowledge. And under a religious system, this general knowledge was largely ethical and moral. Under a religious system of instruction, the child's primary instruction was in good and evil, in character, in the development of convictions, in the recognition of moral duty and responsibility, such as obedience to parent or authority, maintenance and protection of the laws of the community. The individual was taught uh, certain self-disciplines. He might be even taught the dignity of poverty. He was certainly taught the indignity of attaining worldly goods by unreasonable or unfair means. Under this general theory, then, of principles of education, two types of instruction were given. One was the general theory of knowledge ending in the concept of the baccalaureate. In this general theory of knowledge, the individual uh, gradually gained control of what might be termed instruments of knowing within himself. He learned reading, writing, and arithmetic, which were to become tools rather than actual attainments in their own right. With them, he could approach or attack other subjects. Therefore, they became basic instruments of knowing. He gained certain moral insight, and he was given a basic knowledge of such crafts and trades as might be necessary to his survival. This was all in the general line. If he came from a better level of society, his general education would include literature and letters. He would learn to know something of the philosophers, uh, something of the artists, musicians, something of the cultured people of the world who had preceded him, and uh, would learn from these things uh, a number of points which might be applied to the cultivation of his own gentility. The, the, the broad pro program had to come first. This broad program then prepared the individual largely to be a gentleman. Now at that time this was very important if he was a gentleman and no importance at all if he didn't belong to the proper level of society. But higher education did verge toward this problem of gentility. It helped the individual to recognize values also. He had to labor hard and long for what he learned. He was miserably treated by his instructors who thought nothing of beating him half to death for no particular reason except their own sadism. He was struggling against uh, something almost as cruel as a certain type of apprenticeship, and some of the old apprenticeship systems were very bad, the masters actually making complete slaves out of their apprentices and uh, actually grudging them enough food for survival. This situation made education a difficult, a long and tedious problem.
And those who attained it did so because of an irresistible determination to attain it. Nothing was handed on a silver platter in those days. With the rise of the humanists after the beginning of the 17th century, we find a gradual encroachment upon the generalities of education. We find that the individual looking out into the world of knowledge became early fascinated with some aspect of knowledge, so that by degrees the time allotment was reduced as far as generalities were concerned, and specialties were more and more emphasized. By the middle of the 18th century, education had already broken up into a large group of specialties. These specialties, however, were moving very slowly in comparison to what we know as specialties today. It also is interesting to realize how the books of great learning at that time really uh, unfolded the information that young people needed. There were, for example, whole books written on this learned subject as the preparation of periwigs, and they became part of education. Periwig being a powdered wig worn by a dignitary for some purpose or other, especially as justice on the bench in the English courts. Uh, other uh, learned uh, problems included the how to grind pepper and things of that nature. And whole tirades were written on the menace and danger of the drinking of chocolate and the deterioration of Western European culture. All these things were just moving in in every direction. For the first time, uh, European people heard of foreign plants and animals. It was not probably till the 18th century that Europe finally gave up the idea of the existence of mermaids and unicorns. Up to that time, they had been included in the official textbooks of zoology. So not only were they learning a lot that wasn't so in those days, but they were also wading through a mass of ill-digested material. Uh, textbooks were so heavy that they were chained to benches, and a little ordinary reference work might mean the shifting of a ton of literature. Most of the books were not re readable, uh, and above all the miseries, a great many of them were written in medieval Latin, which was one of the most indecipherable languages on earth. <laughs> Far worse than Sanskrit, Chinese, or court Russian. These problems uh, called for more reformations. One of the first of these reformations was to get what were called the lower grades of education into the argo of the people. Uh, Paracelsus of Hohenheim, remember, was one of the first to teach uh, the principles of medicine in the language of the people, in his case, Low German. Up to that time, all learning, everything that was important for man to know was in Latin, and such Latin, Latin the like of which had never before been seen, and which still is a sealed book. Most works in Latin of that period are not even translated today. It's been given up as almost a hopeless job. For not only were the books written in a very corrupt Latin, but most of the typesetters could not read Latin, <laughs> which also resulted in a joyous situation. Also, there was a delightful habit in those days when they wanted a line of type to come out even, and it didn't, they just threw away a few letters. This uh, further complicated the effort to find out what the author intended. When Martin Luther read uh, his version of the Bible in Low German for the first time, he couldn't read it. He had translated it himself, but he couldn't make out the printed form. It was uh, so bad. So this problem led to broad reforms and the effort to bring the basic principles of general education into the language of the people. This was a beginning that uh, was to bear considerable fruit, but even some of the real fine leaders of our thought were very unhappy about the whole situation. One of the most unhappy was dear old Lord Bacon, and when the time came for him to write one of his most important books, he first wrote it in Latin, then translated it into English himself, later taking the English translation and translating it back into Latin. <laughs> he wanted to be sure the job was thoroughly done, and it is in this way that we received the deaugmentus or the advancement and proficiency of learning.
That, the Latin scholars died hard. Uh, but like most of that particular group, uh, they had a lost cause. A uh, man was moving and he could no longer be delayed uh, by uh, the unreadable, unpronounceable Latin grammar that dominated at that time. Having gotten some education into English, the work went on apace until today we are only here and there corrupted, but if we continue on our present uh, course, particularly in medicine, pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical Latin is liable to put us back again into the Dark Ages. <laughs> because at the present time, a special handbook is being issued by the American Medical Association for no purpose but to help the doctor pronounce the present list of available remedies and figure out what they are. This situation has been a very heavy burden on learning and it took a long time to break away from it. At this same period in uh, education, Comenius, who was to uh, play a very important part, advanced his idea of the Pansathic University. He also uh, attempted to bring together the old and the new systems of education by creating what might be termed a basic uh, school of principles for the instruction of the very young and for those who were about uh, to enter upon formal education. He was desperately determined, if he could, to prevent what the uh, earlier system called the baccalaureate from disappearing. But now, instead of it being the first several years of schooling, he believed that it could be placed into the preschool or early school life of the student. Comenius had the very simple idea that a child could be taught good and bad could be taught respect and honor, could be taught patience and self-discipline, could be taught a, a certain measure of integrity even before it could read and write. Therefore, start early was the opinion of Comenius. Remember, and he was working in the 17th century, his thought was, remember, that it's going to be very difficult for your child to survive the corrupting influence of education. Therefore, the only thing to do is to get his character well set before he's exposed to it. If he goes dashing into education without morals, he will never have any morals. Well, uh, Comenius was thinking rather straight for his time. And, of course, as a reward for this, he was totally ignored. <laughs> Whereas a number of rather silly little books, uh, which antedated and perhaps became the archetype of the McDuffie readers, uh, were uh, generally accepted. So Comenius became the father of the McGuffey system, but his own principles were ignored. By this time also, we were beginning to feel the exhilaration of knowledge. Uh, we were no longer a people, uh, even uh, when I was quite young, I remember visiting in eastern Pennsylvania farming families. I lived with one or two of these farming families at one time, and there were seven or eight children, and they were, they were successful farming people. Uh, the whole family got into the wagon every Sunday morning and went about eight miles to church. They then spread a picnic on the church lawn afterwards and had a reunion with their friends and relatives and went home again. This was Sunday. The rest of the week, these people worked in their fields, gathering in their grain, they subscribed to a weekly newspaper. They made about three trips a year to a large city, that is one of over 5,000 population, where they did the marketing and shopping for the year. These, this family was a standard family. They could all read and write. They had only a dozen books in, the, in their possession. There were no available libraries. They could read, they could write, they could think. But there was no problem in their lives of advanced educational insight. Uh, they had each had probably the equivalent with breaks for harvesting and bad weather about two years of schooling and were considered to be respectable, well-informed agriculturists. They had all they regarded and they were regarded as needing. And what was necessary for them uh, further was provided by the clergyman, the local lawyer, and the local doctor. 
Uh, this was their way of life. They felt no other need. This situation uh, could not go on, however. Uh, the world was moving, times were changing, and little by little, uh, the need for bringing education to the people was strongly and clearly felt, not only in uh, Europe, but also in the gradually integrating society of America. So by the middle of the 19th century, education began to take on formidable proportions. And uh, whereas in the time of Dickens, a child was fortunate that had a year of schooling, today the child is regarded as unfortunate if he cannot have 20 years of schooling. This has become, again, one of the great situations. The tremendous accumulation and the tremendous uh, exhilaration of knowledge in the last hundred years has broken down the whole theory of education as it was originally devised. Our education was originally upon the assumption that all that was to be known was already known. And the, the average person didn't live long enough to discover this was not true. Because rap the motion was so slow that a man educated in a small community in England or in Germany around the year of 1600 could live to be 98 years old and rest with his fathers without feeling that he had in any way um, failed to be contemporary. The contemporary pace was so slow that it was measured in centuries. Today it is measured in days or in weeks. There were no really abrupt changes, and such changes as there were in those days were so gradual that the average person could adjust to them without any very great shock. Now we have a situation in which not only is change continuous, but by the very nature of change, change is continually undermining the previous structure of facts. We are not only forced to learn more than ever before, but we are forced to unlearn continuously that which we regarded as necessary. Now this does not always mean that we have to unlearn because what we learned was not so. It may also be that it has become obsolete. And this is essentially true in nearly all branches of specialized endeavor. The person today who graduates from school has no reasonable expectation of educational security for the span of his life. If he wishes to be advanced in his profession, if he wishes to be contemporary in his thinking, his education must go on continuously to the end of his life. If he fails to make this continual adjustment with the motion of so-called progress, he is soon going to be out of date. His knowledge is going to be inadequate. He will be unable to adjust to the changes that arise, and he will be unable to compete with those who are more industrious in learning than himself. So we now suddenly have a new concept. Learning is no longer merely remembering what is known. Learning now is a problem of learning to anticipate the unknown. Learning to uh, be able to adjust oneself to a situation in which tomorrow will have no valid relationship with today, so far as consistency is concerned. This means that we are in such a rapid transition that the whole structure of learning has lost nearly all of its authoritarianism. We can no longer quote Aristotle with finality on any subject. We can no longer quote Darwin with finality. In fact, you cannot get up today in a university and quote Einstein with finality. Uh, you are now only able to quote that which has appeared in the journal that was published in the morning, because the afternoon edition may take it back. <laughs> this situation leaves the average person in an educational dilemma. Uh, 
He must go through this elaborate process of learning. But when he has completed it with honors, he has not learned it. He must spend 10 or 15 years mastering a science, only to learn when he graduates that he has not mastered it at all, and that the science has been more, moving more rapidly than his learning has been able to progress. It is actually a fact today in this highly technical department of learning that a man who graduated a year ago would have difficulty starting again at the beginning of that system of education and graduating again. <coughs> in other words, if you graduated as a doctor in science and you went back to your own first year in science and tried to take the examination which you passed with honors four, five, six, eight, ten years ago, you would probably fail. Not because you have forgotten a thing, but because what you learned isn't even being taught anymore. This is cutting in also under the value of what you have learned. So that instead of being able to say, I have a doctorate in science, I am therefore uh, now qualified to enter into the scientific world, this strange thing called change has cut in under that doctorate and has very largely invalidated it. In order to be able, therefore, to go on in, for instance, in a scientific laboratory where you might be wishing to do something in the scientific line, the first thing you do when you graduate with your sheepskin in one hand is to be taken by some large corporation into its own laboratories and put to school again. That is what it really amounts to. Because in the course of life which you have spent trying to learn, that institution for which you are now working has outstripped everything that you have known. To learn, therefore, is no longer to take hold of something, and when you have it, you have it. This no longer exists. Learning today is a series of perpetual adjustments, a problem of being eternally contemporary. The generation that teaches you is archaic before it has finished teaching you. The very professors that are now instructing you could not get a job which you hope to get when you graduate. To meet this kind of a situation, we have to face not only uh, a complete reorganization of the basic theory of education, but we must in some way streamline or reduce or integrate the concept of education into a more workable instrument. To attain a specialty in medicine today, for instance, surgery or something of that nature, it is not unreasonable to assume that the average student will have to spend from 18 to 24 years in school. Well, this is a long time. It not only is a long time in terms of its discouragement to the average person, but it is a major inroad upon the total life of the individual. It means that he is to, has to be from 25 to 30 years old before he can begin to practice his profession. Even then there are further restrictions upon the probability of his success. And he is fortunate if he can really get himself on his feet and going by the time he is 30. And according to present employment standards, he is obsolete at 40. Thus, he has about ten years with which to meet the tremendous challenge, not only of his own survival, but bringing up a family and preparing for his old age. By the time the person who is now going to school graduates twenty years from now, he is going to be living in a world 
which the present day school does not even dream about. Yet he must continue to go along on procedures, methods, and policies that are not changing. He must realize that there is a constantly widening interval between the public school and what we might term the areas of practical knowledge. This widening interval may not be so noticeable in elementary education, but it is certainly present and obvious in higher education. How to cross this interval under the present policy is not an easy question to answer, because those now controlling education have no idea of this interval themselves. They belong to an entirely different bracket. They are antiques. They are all broken down people who graduated ten years ago and are already worthless. And that's just about where it is. And it's getting worse every day. To meet this situation, we have to begin to think about some of the things which it seems to me could help us. One is that education will ultimately have to be divided into two areas, as it was long ago, but before different motives. There must be an area in which ed education primarily is concerned with equipping the individual to be an individual. In other words, there are elements of education that will never change, or will change so rapidly, or rather change so slowly that we will never notice them. And unfortunately, these are the areas that are neglected. <laughs> it will be a long time, for example, before uh, education or science can advance beyond the point where the individual has to learn to read and write. And this is being neglected. This is one of the continuing things. We join with all education of all time in the absolute requirement of literacy. Unless the individual is able to interpret the symbols of his language, unless he is able to communicate he cannot instruct himself or give instruction. So for 10,000 years, since the invention of any form of the written word, men have continued this procedure without interruption or change. This is important. How long would it take, or should it take, the average child to learn to read and write? I strongly suspect that the average person could obtain the degree of literacy which he is likely to find necessary in life in a period of not over two years, probably less. At the end of two years of specialized and well-developed instruction, the average individual would have control uh, with some intellectual maturity of at least two to, two, uh, to three thousand words. And these constitute about 85 to 90 percent of the vocabulary of the average American adult. An individual who attains to a vocabulary of 5,000 words is considered to be remarkable. And in the average field of activity, no such general vocabulary outside of trade names or special scientific terms will be required. The next thing that the child must certainly have is rudimentary mathematics. He must learn to add up his grocery bill. He must be able to determine his income tax. That's very important. He must also be in a position to use numbers intelligently as symbols of ideas in various projects and activities with which he is engaged. He should have a general knowledge of the peoples of the world around him. He should have a basic education in what might be termed the broad principles which he will later need. This education can be bestowed in three ways. It can be bestowed by the school, by the family, and by the religion or cultural 
outlet, whatever it may be. Or it is estimated that with fair luck, the essential principles of this type of education can be communicated to a normal child in a period of not more than three or four years. In other words, a child beginning, say, at schooling at eight instead of six should be able to have a fair grasp of all of these essentials by the time it is twelve years old. The reason that it doesn't have this grasp is because of the increasing uh, loss of momentum through massive number. The necessity of planning education to move at the pace of the most limited minds and the tremendous complication of the actual entanglement of education in its own processes, which have become so bungly and so numerous and so confusing and contradictory. And the interference in educational procedure by an infinite variety of pressured and prejudiced groups, as all these things are taken together, education itself is rendered comparatively impotent. And the young people who should be educated are not receiving what they really need or what they can really use. Uh, take out of education all these cultural slowdowns, many of them artificial or experimentation, for experiment is now the curse of education. The um, result would be that by the time the average child is 12 or 13 years old, it could know most of what is necessary for its own intellectual survival, for its own intellectual uh, ability to cope with new ideas. It could understand processes of thinking so that it would not be necessary for it to lean upon a complete thought formula being bestowed upon it, but rather could arrive at reasonable conclusions by its own means. This being, being possible would give us the next step that is necessary. In four years, making full use of the various media that we have, the average child could be better educated than the average child of today is after 12 years of schooling. Now, how would we accomplish some of these things? One would be to draw the various media into play which are available. Cutting into the waste time, for example, in radio and television, and transforming this time into valuable schoolroom extension work. Not schoolroom extension in the times that we think of, in which television so some uh, dowdy-looking old professor uh, doing it on a blackboard, which no one wishes to see and which will uh, promptly be turned off in favor of the untouchables. What I mean is this. When we want to know geography, we go there. Television takes us shows us everything that we have long and laboriously tried to learn from books. The television takes us into the life, the culture of any people. Television takes us into history, into these basic principles of the sciences, into all the areas of culture. Television and radio, as a supplement to education, could take hundreds of hours out of classroom time and give the individual not an intellectual concept of things, but a vac actual visual experience of participation. Much of what is now taught in grammar school could be taught entirely uh, through this type of instruction, whether an, in a classroom or at home, because the actual seeing of the procedures themselves will reduce the time of teaching very, very markedly. Another thing that will contribute very greatly uh, to the uh, advancement of these problems is the gradual development of international education. And this will someday have to come. We had it in Europe in the feudal period, but it was again heavily in, uh, dominated by the cloister system. 
but a student in Europe in the 12th, 13th, 14th century joined a university, but he did not necessarily stay there. Part of his education was to be transferred periodically from one school to another in one country or another, so that in the course of his instruction, in taking his lessons, he had been able also to travel to the greater part of Europe. He had already come in contact with practically every culture of his time before he graduated. He took so many years in Germany, so many months in Spain, so much time in Holland, and certain other length of time in France. He was already well acquainted with Italy, he visited Portugal, he did a little postgraduate work in England, and by the time he really graduated, he was not only informed according to his day, but was well traveled and had the experience of direct contact with other peoples. This is a valuable experience. And a great deal could be done to hasten and deepen educational uh, procedure by combining education with the experience of social adjustment with the cultures of other peoples. This has already been advanced as a possible powerful force toward world peace and toward preventing the misunderstandings between nations that result from just plain old-fashioned ignorance. And it is perfectly possible for an individual to graduate cum laude from one of our greatest institutions without sense enough not to be intolerant. But if he lives with other people, if he works with them, if he actually understands them, he is not nearly so likely to be able to go along uh, with a pig-headed prejudice against someone on the other side of a national fence. This type of thing means a great deal. Also, learning by doing is a very important thing, not only in the trades, but also in sciences and arts. Young children can be already taught most of the principles of basic science as play rather than as work. In fact, many young people today are teaching themselves better out of school than they are being taught in school as a result of their tremendous interest in the creation of model airplanes, uh, model motor cars, model, uh, model space uh, rockets, and things of this nature. They have already a fair knowledge in these fields which do interest them, uh, much better knowledge than they receive in school. So gradually a policy can be developed by means of which an extension of education becomes part of the play life, the game life, the happy life, the non-tedious, joyous expression of young people simply living and enjoying the process of finding out the things they want to know. Much time can be saved by simply building this concept into the American way of education. Also, this process keeps these young people contemporary. Uh, they are no longer going to sit back and read Dickens as their fathers and grandfathers did. They are now out to explore an unknown world, and they intend to explore it. But they have not the proper faculties and facilities uh, under our existing situation to meet the demands of their own minds for a larger experience of life. This proceeds into nearly every form of our educational system. Up to now, education is built up upon remembering formulas. Education is built up on the process of becoming informed about what other people know. This is necessary in certain professions, arts, and sciences. But broadly speaking, this has been overemphasized, and the result has been a terrible loss in the production of thinkers. Instead, therefore, of continuing this process of piling one mass of facts, we have to learn how to cope with situation rather than to remember it. Instead of feeling that we are informed because we can quote somebody else, our informedness must be proven by the fact that we can adjust to the unknown of tomorrow. The essential purpose of education is to create a person 
who can safely live tomorrow. It is not enough to equip him with any group of dogma upon which he must depend for knowing. It is assumed, of course, that tomorrow is merely the extension of today. This was once true. To, and now, however, tomorrow may be the complete contradiction of today. There are several ways in which this can be possible. One thing, for example, is that with this high development that we have in nuclear physics, today we have an uneasy peace. Tomorrow we might have a war of extermination. The individual who is educated must not only be educated to get along in the un uneasy peace that he now experiences, he must be equipped to meet the challenge of a complete catastrophe if it should occur. We have already found that a great industry, like the motion picture industry, has grown, reached a tremendous sphere of influence, has declined, and now virtually died within the generation in which we live. Uh, individuals pass through its entire career carrying with them a tremendous institution in its rise and fall in 50 years. Uh, the individual who trained for that type of life is already unemployable. No matter what we work with, we work in a complete period of transition. And to meet this period of transition, we have to have a different kind of education. And the point that is most important of all seems to be that this different kind of better education could be conferred more rapidly than we are now doing it. Looking forward, sociologically speaking, into the next 25 years of our way of life, we cannot hope to estimate the changes that will occur. But we can, to a measure, suggest the probable directions of some of these changes. We know that beyond any question of doubt, many of our most cherished and considered staple institutions will be gone. We know also that most or many of our methods of doing things will be obsolete. That somewhere along the line, this whole situation will change. We know, for example, what electronics has done in the field of human endeavor in a comparatively few years. A few years ago, there were no uh, careers in the field of electronics. Today, it is one of the most promising fields. What its future is, however, again rests upon tomorrow, upon the next discovery of the human mind. Uh, this procedure goes on and on and on, and uh, to meet it and to face it is a tremendous challenge upon the life of the individual. So lots of young people coming up now, looking around the problem, have decided their own way about this. They feel that what we call living today is just a continuous process of going to school from the cradle to the grave but that after you graduate formally, you are paid to go to school, whereas previously you had to pay to go to school. Before you graduate, you have to pay. After graduating, you are paid moderately for the continuance and improvement of your own knowledge. Now, as in the cases of some of these more pressureful fields, uh, I have talked to men, for example, in learned professions, and they have told me, they say to keep up in a reasonable way with the present trends and changes in our fields to enable ourselves to say honorably and factually that we are up to the minute in our own specialization would require approximately 200 hours a day of work for the rest of our lives. It would take that length of time to read the new literature on the subject, more than that length of time to try to understand it. The individual, and most modestly speaking, finds a career 
as far as profession and trade are concerned, is becoming an ever more consuming force in his life. In order to maintain himself in one of the higher brackets of society in which he lives, in order to regard himself as an executive, a leader, or a technically educated person, he must practically devote his life to the continual amassing of knowledge. If he does not do this, he will be outraced in a short time, and he may be replaced by another person much younger and less intelligently informed than himself, <coughs> but possessing the immediate answers to some new situation that has arisen. This means that what we call education, progress, development, these things not only become essentially the foundation of our economic survival, but they gradually encroach upon every other area of our lives. And in the end, the problem of trying to know will very largely eclipse the experience of living itself, so that we will no longer live as persons, to experience as persons uh, the unfoldment of our own characters. We will live merely to become continually contemporary with the advancement of knowledge. Into this general shambles will disappear the American home, the American concept of family, <coughs> friendship, leisure, and all the quiet ways of self-expression and self-improvement that we know. A really well-trained and up-and-coming young scientist cannot have much time for recreation. He cannot do much with music or art. He has very few evenings with his family. His children hardly know him. Yet he must do this or he will be unemployable in five years. Something has to be done about it because it's gradually uh, destroying the very ends for which it was intended. The purpose of education was to liberate man, liberate him from the unknown. Actually, the present process of education is enslaving man. In trying to liberate him, liberate him from what he did not know, we have put him into slavery to what he does know. We have not achieved our end. We have not achieved leisure. I remember only maybe 15 or 20 years ago, we had a political movement in this country that talked about the possibility of replacing men with machines so that within 10 or 15 or 20 years, according to their thinking, we would all uh, have a perpetual holiday on full pay. It didn't materialize, and it never will. It has the uh, utopian element in it. But even if it were to materialize, even if man suddenly found that he had developed instruments and means by means of which he would no longer need to work and would be able to sustain himself on a high status level from this time on through the rest of his life, it would still now take man 500 years to learn what to do with his own leisure. He has lost the whole theory. He has lost the end toward which labor was directed, namely security. The purpose of work was that the individual should attain a certain security and have certain leisure and protection and ability and means to accomplish the things that he wanted to do. He can no longer even dream of the things he wants to do. The cost of achieving continuing survival is at the present time too high to permit much luxury thinking outside of itself. This means that religion and philosophy are largely and heavily neglected, and therefore that education itself is suffering correspondingly. Education is now absolutely unable to cope with the problem of the moral development of young people. It is unable to cope uh, with the uh, 
dissatisfaction within the body of the young scholastic group. It is unable to cope with juvenile crime within the very sacred sanctuaries of education or in early life outside of education. So somehow something has gotten completely lost. And to regain it or find out what it is, uh, is going to be one of the duties of the educator of tomorrow. One thing we know he's going to have to do to make possible the advancement of our way of life, he's going to have to cut down the time problem in education. This to him seems impossible. Today we are assured that we need more scientists, one of the long, slow uh, subjects which take many years to master. We need more mathematicians, we need more physicists, more biologists, more chemists, more experts in various fields, which means that we need more 18 to 22 or 24 years, year school men. Which means that we are going to graduate these men in their late 20s or early 30s before they're able to make a living. This tremendous investment cut out of the life of the human being is not justified by the result. This individual is not able to prove that this immense amount of schooling is producing in him uh, a maximum achievement. It is producing an individual who is worn out, tired out, and disillusioned before he graduates. And it is also in these long, long years of intellectual struggle with subjects for which he may or may not be even adapted. It is in this period that his dissatisfactions, his rebellions, and his intensities arise, and the result is that most of our institutions of learning are having communistic difficulties on their own campuses. Also, it means that the establishment of the home, the creation of the family, proper year for, years for marriage, these things are all cast aside in this tremendous problem of trying to be educated. And uh, according to materialism, which is still rampant in these institutions, there seems to be no particularly good reason for all this, for the fact that in uh, the ultimate state of things, there seems to be no difference in, the, in between educated and uneducated dust. Uh, once we have returned uh, to the good earth, it seems to make very little difference whether we were Phi Beta Kappas or not. <laughs> So the entire problem from a materialistic standpoint is absolute vanity. But we are pushed on by the tremendous intensities of our worldly so-called processes and progresses. The uh, solution lies in the problem in a way of not more than ten years of necessary schooling. The individual can know all that we really know in ten years. And uh, in many cases he can find out much sooner. Because after he graduates and goes into the learned professions, if he's an honest man, for every ten questions that are asked him after he has had the twenty years of work, for every ten questions that are asked him, he will have to admit that in eight of them he does not know the answer and there's no prospect of his finding out. <laughs> Consequently, he has tremendous weight of dead material that is not contributing to knowledge in any reasonable way whatsoever. <clears throat> All of this problem builds up around our concept of what constitutes civilization and what constitutes progress. It is awfully difficult, in fact impossible, to tell people that there's anything wrong with a system uh, which is in a problem of the constant adventure of discovering. Uh, it's hard to tell an individual that all this tremendous amount of work that is being done in all the areas of advanced sciences, that all this is not progress. It's hard to tell him that. It's hard to convince him, for example, of something that I wrote about uh, 
back in 1924 when I did an article on the mystery of the toothbrush. And this was a very important educational work, but it seems never to have made much of an impression upon Harvard. But at the same time, uh, I feel it was a very important thing. And that is that somewhere is the unsung, perhaps unknown, unhonored, and forgotten hero who invented a toothbrush. Now, by means of a toothbrush, it is perfectly possible for the individual to preserve his teeth a little longer, especially if he uses the right toothbrush, the right motion, and the right dentifrice. All these are very important, and like every other field of human endeavor, these change every five minutes. <laughs> and there is no one more miserable than the individual who is using yesterday's dentifrice. Uh, he probably won't have a friend left alive. In uh, this situation, however, man has for thousands of years struggled through the darkness of ignorance, superstition, and error before he was able to produce a toothbrush. But during the period in which he was struggling for these, through these tremendous struggles of the ages, something has been overlooked. He didn't need the toothbrush. <laughs> it was not until man became a more and more refined creature. It was not until he lived more and more stupidly. <laughs> it was not until he lost all common sense and dietetics and nutrition that he needed a toothbrush. But gradually, he broke every law of health until teeth practically fell out of his mouth of their own accord and threatened not to last uh, to middle life. He found that all the ways that he was living uh, were giving him dental problems that self-respecting camels, horses, elephants, dogs, and miscellaneous chimpanzees never suffered from. But having broken all laws and come to almost the state where he was toothless by the time he graduated from college, he has met the situation, he has solved the riddle of the ages, he has redeemed the faith of his contemporaries and bestowed a great blessing upon the future by giving them the toothbrush. He has not corrected the reason for the tooth falling out. He has not found out what causes cavities. He has not learned to take care of the teeth he had, but he has a toothbrush, and all is well. Now, this to a large measure is progress. Progress is the individual finding solutions for problems that should never have existed, and which never would have existed, would have existed had he not been stupid in the first place and continued to cultivate it down through history to the present time. So a great deal of progress, as we know it, is simply the individual trying to rescue himself from his own mistakes, to try to find some way of patching up his own superb ignorance in all the essential values of life. Progress, for instance, today is an attempt to balance military power to prevent the Russians from attacking us before the Chinese can attack both of us. <laughs> Progress is therefore to preserve this delicate balance of power which should never have existed or been needed in the first place, and not the whole world united in one magnificent exhibition of adolescent selfishness. Progress is not all man moving gloriously forward. Progress is man trying to pick himself up after falling over himself thousands of times. If we could straighten out some of the essential principles of life, this whole struggle for what we call progress would lead to a moderate way of life toward essential purposes that are valuable. And we would end up far better off than we will be by the present procedure 
and with a little energy left to enjoy our well-earned uh, benefits when they arrive. Education has not educated itself on the principles of what are of that are necessary for the survival of mankind. And very large part of our tremendous competitiveness is simply due to the competitiveness of others. All this competition is not leading to progress. It is leading to a ruthless warfare over profit that will ultimately submerge us and probably end drive us into a socialized existence. At which time, many people will be bitterly unhappy, but they have never done anything to prevent it and would never stop their own selfishness long enough to cooperate with any cause that was trying to prevent it. Progress is not just this headlong dash that we are trying to incorporate into the concept at the present time. Progress has nothing to do with who gets to the moon first. Progress has nothing to do with two or three poor astronauts wandering out in space hoping they'll get back. These things are exciting, they're interesting, they're remarkable, but as the old Frenchman used to say, what have they to do with the price of eggs? And the answer is very little. It is interesting. They are luxuries we might enjoy. And if in the name of real progress we wanted to do these things, we could do them graciously and pleasantly and have a lot of fun with them and ensure as much safety as possible before these experiments are made. And instead of throwing countries into bankruptcy in a wild dash for these ends, they would gradually and naturally develop in a peaceful society if we wanted them. But under our present situation, progress is only a kind of struggle for survival against the tremendous pressure of knowledge. Knowledge is frightening us to death, wearing us out, and destroying the essential end for which it was intended. So we have to think a little bit about what might be done about it. What do we need to learn today? The average person has lessons which, if he could learn them, or could pass on this learning to his own children, or the schools could pass it on to the nation, would in 20 or 25 years probably have a marked effect upon the morale of our people and might very well make the whole world a little better place to live in. First thing of all, every child is entitled to know what is the great good toward which all this struggle leads. What is this accomplishment? What are we doing, and why are we doing it? And questions like that today are completely taboo. We probably would have very much less difficulty with young people if we could answer the question very simply, what is the plan behind the present effort of mankind to grow? Why are we growing, and why do we think that what we are doing is growing, and how can we prove it? And if we continue growing as we're growing now, will we survive another hundred years? These are questions that need answers, and to find answers for these questions will be to integrate the human uh, potential, the tremendous mass of human wealth and means, energy, power, towards some useful goal. I think every child entering school, along with the salute to the flag, should have a clear concept of why it is important for him to do what he is going to learn to do, and how this accomplishment will inevitably contribute to the collective security of his creation. 
In other words, I think that young person should know before he starts to learn that if he succeeds and becomes an outstanding person, that he is going to be a benevolent force in the way of life, and that he is not, under any conditions, going to succeed at the expense of another or advance his own cause by preventing the normal advancement of other people, nor will he regard himself as successful merely because he has more than other people have, nor will he think in legislating, in living, in working primarily of profit, but that he will think of the great plan and reason for the existence of his country, his nation, and himself. What is his prospect? What is he doing? Why is he doing it? When he goes into a course in medicine, has he already learned that medicine is a public service which is going to give him a useful living and a useful reason for existence? But that the exploitation of this, uh, the false use of his knowledge, for the unreasonable advancement of himself at the expense of his patients is as serious a crime against society as murder. Does he know this? If he does not know this before he gets out of the third grade, he is not educated. I don't care what else he knows. If he does not know these things, he will become in his due time the parent of wars the parent of more corruptions of peoples, of more disasters, of more prison camps, and marches toward Batham. He will continue to preserve the intolerances and intemperances which burden us. This young person must not be told that this is a noble career. It must be proved to him. He must see it. He must touch it with his own consciousness. He must look around him and see that this career that he is in is being served by honorable persons above corruption. If he does not see this, then there is no particular reason why he should regard education as adequate simply because it perpetuates the way his ancestors made their mistakes. There is no reason why a future generation should be instructed in how to live by an older generation that is committing suicide. So education has got to get at these facts. And education has got to show the individual the reason for his own existence. It's got to show him why he should go to school and learn to read and write and make him feel so much in that direction, so deeply moved by it, that he will want all reasonable education that he can secure. It must also teach him the value of his own life, the value of his own consciousness as a person. He must learn that education is a way of unfolding his own nature, his own character, and that education is absolutely worthless to him. If it helps him to make a million dollars, but does not help him how to become a conscious, reasonable, well-adjusted human being. That the end of education is that man shall live well. And by living well, then he shall surround himself with those things which actually enrich his life. I have known many persons through the years who have worked, struggled, sacrificed, dangered health, family, and life to accumulate vast amounts of worldly goods. And when they had it, all they could do with it was waste it. I know persons who came up from young manhood working with, as oil riggers digging into the ground, heaving pipes, building scaffolding. Finally they made it. They became very rich. And what did they do? 
they took their life savings, the life work they had done, and were perfectly happy to spend it merely to provide food and drink for their own cronies. These people spent thousands of dollars simply to entertain each other with no thought of any values involved. Here they worked for what they had, but their education did not help them to use what they had. They were perfectly miserable. So education has, has to lay foundations first. And if it lays these foundations well and honorably, all other things can be reasonably accomplished. But without these foundations, we have no education. Now, whether this process of education should be set up as a separate structure, there is difference of opinion. Perhaps man is capable of having this gradually impressed upon him by the very psychological environment in which he lives. This would be true if the environment was worth anything. If our great media of communication, the newspapers, radio, television, motion pictures, all these instruments were quietly but systematically indoctrinating the human being with the principles of a proper way of life, we probably would never have to teach it as a separate course of study. Man exposed to it, man accepting it, works with it. And if the principles we know are necessary were attractively presented, we might never have to formalize any system for their instruction at all. They would simply grow with us, just as bad habits at the present time attach themselves to our personalities. But in one way or another, we're going to have to find out that education is different from skill or technique or specialization in training. Education and training are two things completely different. A trade school trains people, but education is not primarily a trade school. But any education system which teaches the individual only a trade or a profession, and I don't care whether it's bricklaying or astronomy, I don't care whether it is business management or the most advanced physical or mathematical sciences. If the education is solely to permit the individual to have a career in those areas, then he is attending not a university but a trade school. We think of trade schools now as largely for those who are uneducatable in other ways. Individuals of extremely limited talents or limited means available for education go to trade schools. Actually, most of our so-called education, higher education today, is only a glorified trade school. It is not an educational institution. It is not teaching man to be educated. It is merely teaching him to be skillful in a specialized area. Whether it be mental or physical skill is inconsequential at the moment. Actually, then, we've got to separate the concept of the trade school from the university. We've got to recognize that the primary function of the trade school is to teach the individual to have a career in whatever area he wants it. The principal purpose of a university is to create a thinker, a human being, capable of managing his own life wisely and honorably and achieving a rich and purposeful personal existence. These are two completely separate things. The university has become the trade school. The trade school cannot take on the, the duties of the university. Therefore, the true duties of the university are not represented in modern society except by a few independent groups struggling to preserve something they know to be true. We've got to get out of the idea, which the university is carefully fostering, that the purpose of a university is to produce $25,000 a year men. Uh, here is your way of thinking. 
An individual graduating from grammar school can earn $5,000 a year. An individual graduating from high school is good for from eight to 12000 a year if he's pretty smart. The individual who graduates from college is a $25,000 a year man at his best. And if he takes two postgraduate courses and gets his doctorate, he probably ought to be good for $50,000 a year with luck. Now, this is the way it is thought of today. When a young man is asked, or, or asks, whether he should go to college or not, the answer is, do you want to make $10,000 a year, or do you want to make $20,000 a year? Nothing more to it. This is, this is a more dangerous situation than communistic indoctrination. Because this situation is striking the individual at a time when he cannot create an understanding of his own situation. He does not understand the life of the world in which he lives. He is starting out, and he is told today that the purpose of education is one soul's complete purpose, whether he wishes to have status as a person in the higher economic brackets, or doesn't he wish. And this is fostered, I know, in industry and all forms of modern activity by a conspiracy between business and the university, in which now business has been taught parrot-like that it must select university men for all of its best jobs. This, regardless of the fact that some of these university men cannot read and write, many of them cannot spell, very few can use the mathematical tables with which a business is involved, and in that particular line of business, their football experience is likely to prove of slight value. And yet, this is the way it is done. So education today has got to approach this problem differently. Education creates a citizen. Education creates the convictions of an Abraham Lincoln, the wisdom and practical understanding of a Benjamin Franklin, the dedication and heroism of a George Washington. These things represent the achievements and enrichments of the consciousness of man. This is what education bestows. Wealth was originally taken by hitting a man over the head with a club, or by storming his city and putting his peoples to death, and then raiding the treasury. Later in our own Western Plains, it was done with a Remington or a six-shooter. Wealth is not the same thing as success. Uh, the true purpose of education is to produce this person who is a safe member of the world in which he lives. And until we get this idea over, our education is never going to save us from any major disaster in life but rather will continue to produce the kind of people whose scientific skill is sufficient for them to advance projects that will blow themselves and everyone else to perdition. And education has never taught them why they shouldn't do it. So we say that there should be trade schools, and that these trade schools represent one level of education, how to make a living, but that these constitute a secondary level and that an individual, before he is qualified uh, to assume the responsibilities of profession or even trade, must first of all be educated as a person, as a human being. If this was done, we would also get rid of a tremendous amount of lagging and a tremendous amount of waste energy in our educational theory. It would be perfectly possible to get all of our young people into action in this world by the time they're 21 years old, adequately educated to meet the problems of our time, and probably just as well off in specialized areas as they will be now anyway with another eight or ten years, because they will simply be in a position to learn what is new and will not have wasted ten years learning what is no longer important. 
There is only one, there is no good reason why we should advance technical education beyond a certain point. Once the principles are known and grasped, then it is far better for the education to be by the old-fashioned apprenticeship system. And the individual then, going into his profession, with the principles firmly established, learns the new things as they come along, and is not delayed for 10 or 15 years in his career by things which he will never use, never know, never contact again, and were never really true in the first place. It can be streamlined, it can be reduced, and it can be definitely shown uh, that in all these different areas of education, extraordinary economies can be achieved if they are wanted. And out of this problem could easily come a situation in which every American citizen could have a technical education as far as he wants it. Uh, that there would be no longer the waste and stress and conflict now existing, and education could begin to assume a position of moral influence, because actually, as the Greeks realized, the educated person is the only possible leader of the people. And where authority is vested in persons technically skilled and culturally ignorant, the state will ultimately collapse. It, uh, education must be geared to the perpetuation of the values of society, and not merely the continual emphasis upon an individual making his while he's here. And Comenius and several other educators after him, right on down to the present time, have come to the conclusion that it would be a very good plan if man created a world in which he always went to school. Now just as surely as today he goes to the movies or huddles around the television set, his own native inquisitiveness, his properly functioning, human, vitally awake mind, Interested as man naturally is in everything that is interesting, could very easily become part of a class containing the whole nation, that the whole nation would go to school together at all ages of life, that this schooling wouldn't be by the hour, or wouldn't take the man away from his job or make him a pauper while he was learning it, but that this education would be a continuing contact with knowledge, and that he would regard it just as important to spend one evening a week for the rest of his life keeping up with the knowledge of his world as he now does sitting around and wasting that evening on something that produces nothing for himself or anyone else and may end in nothing but a family argument. We are bored because we do not think. For many years, the American people developed the movie habit. And there are persons who actually wrote into newspapers and said that they had been to their local motion picture house two evenings a week for 11 years without missing. These people were simply there because they enjoyed going to a movie and seeing their favorite actor. How much more magnificently could this concept be put to work? There is no question in the world that if it became fashionable, everyone would break their necks to do it, because we all want to do what is being done. That's our trouble. We are doing what is being done, and we're getting more miserable every minute. But there's no reason why every community should not have a magnificent, not an adult education movement in which it sounds as though some poor foreigner who can't speak English is trying to learn, or some individual that couldn't get through grammar school is trying to catch up. This isn't the purpose at all, but the recognition that man himself lives in an unfolding universe, that man's own thoughts keep growing all through life, 
that his world is moving, that the consciousness of his attainments are moving, and that it is perfectly right and proper that every human being keep abreast of them. This uh, in itself would probably go far more further in perpetuating a contemporary way of life, a way of life that is vital with knowledge. By this means also, the average person would then be able to direct much, much of his now scattered time to the various projects and purposes which concern him in the better sense of being concerned. He would have, under a less pressureful, better enlightened, better regulated system, time for his friends, time for his family, time for art and music and beauty and culture, time to write verses of poetry in 17 syllables or in 77 if he prefers, time to grow in a love of beauty, to love art, to love fine things, and to realize that among the problems of education is civilization, that we have to be civilized people. We've separated the concept of education from life assuming that when we graduated, we're there. We now know this is not so, and we have to keep on going to school anyway. But we have built so many errors, so many foolish attitudes around this subject. Why don't we face a simple problem? The child, when it goes, reaches six, seven, eight, whatever year we wish to settle, that is not important, goes to school. In school, he learns those things which are necessary for his own existence, for his cooperation as a citizen of his world, for integration with his family and community, the principles of honor and integrity, and the three R's. By the time he has finished these and a few slightly added embellishments according to the needs of the time, he is then ready for secondary education of some nature. Here he learns uh, quickly, easily, and without uh, the confusion that we now have, because it's been proven again and again that it can be done, it has been proven conclusively that with a little intelligent supervision by uh, thinking people and by teachers who are interested in something more than a job, and most teachers are interested in more than a job, that what is generally taught in four years today could, with everybody working together, be a magnificent success in two years that from this point on the individual passes to his technical training, whatever it may be, that in this technical area, area he gets his basic principles, he learns his vocabulary, he learns the principles underlying the things he wants to do. But instead of being taught all of the part that is no use to him, he then, as soon as his principles are achieved, he moves into his allotted career, taking a, an apprenticeship relationship with knowledge, and growing up with the new ideas, and never having to unlearn the old ones. He then has his career set. He could easily do this and be out of school and in his life work for the time he is 20 to 21 years old with adequate background, with a proper ethical background behind him and some understanding that his own stupidity can destroy his health, break his mind, and ruin his life. He can then also go on to plan a personal life. This personal life will continue, and as a part of his responsibilities as a citizen, he has not only the duty of maintaining this personal life, but once a week, one evening a week, in every community in this country, staggered to make it possible to do so without difficulty, in a place properly and suitably arranged for that purpose. All of those citizens, although all those not at that time attending school, gather together for the purpose of being posted simply, directly, accurately, and non-directionally on the current advancement of mankind in the previous week. What is important? What is new? What has been done? The complete and accurate record of advancement in every area of life. This situation continuing keeps the person adjusted to his time, adjusted to his world. And in areas where through suburban populations and things of that nature where this is less difficult or less easy to accomplish, it can be done as it is being done in Australia today simply by radio or television. But there's no reason why 
the individual should not continue to learn as long as he lives, improve his education, remain a contemporary, well-posted individual on every subject of concern to him, and the common good of his world at the same time. Then he will not even think of graduating finally from any form of knowledge, but he will be able to control or direct or ensoul knowledge, because whatever he learns, he will interpret in terms of basic education. He has been taught what value is. Therefore, he can measure, estimate value. He can support it where he sees it, demand it where he does not find it, and reject situations in which it is absent. This way we can gradually achieve the end that we want. Even among the best-intentioned people today, with the best thoughts and ideas, we find a tremendous amount of prejudice for the simple reason that the average person today does not know what is being done in his world. He does not know what contemporary and immediate thinking on various problems is. He does not know who is doing the important work. He does not know what direction the progresses in art, science, literature, philosophy, all these are leading. He does not know what is being done to bring religious groups into better understanding. He does not know what is actually being accomplished uh, to break down and correct uh, various forms of malpractice in professions and sciences. He does not know what teachers are trying to do. He has no understanding of what uh, the moral and ethical problems of other nations are and how these nations are coping with them. He does not understand or value these things because he does not know them. To the degree that he does not know them, he is in a very unwise position himself. So education is not knowing these things primarily. It is the capacity to use this knowledge when he gets it. And education will then give him the incentive to set up the machinery to make sure that he gets the knowledge. And to just a very moderate degree of union, united effort in these areas could remake a very difficult situation and actually get us out of a fog in the field of learning that has been thick and impenetrable as Los Angeles smog for the last 2,000 years. And out of the smog we must come. Otherwise, we will continue to wander around, believing that we are in a strange and terrible world. And when the smog suddenly clears for a moment, we'll find we've never left our own backyard. That this terrible world is a world of mystery, a mystery which we have not solved because we have not the necessary knowledge. That this knowledge exists, we know. That we do not have it, we also know. That we should have it, we further believe. And under the pressure of our time, we're getting, beginning to suspect that if we don't get it, we're going to be in very bad trouble. Education has got to reconstruct itself to meet the pressures of an age of rapid progress. And that means that every thoughtful human being must be able to adjust to rapid progress without tension and without ever losing his own center of integrity. To make this adjustment, he must have education to protect that center of integrity and knowledge to keep up with the constant changing of his times. He has these two things working together. He is relatively secure, both as a person and as a member of the community in which he lives. Thank you. Thank you.